मैं कैमरा भी दिया हूँ चल रहा है चल रहा है मैं कैमरा का भी दिया ऑडियो मैंने वहाँ का ऑडियो दिया कैमरा भी ऑन कर दे इसी का ठीक है अरे मेरा फोन ठीक है ना आप चेक करते रहना तब भी आपको आउटपुट मिले काफी ट्राई किया अच्छा पांच में ऊपर जाके देखा वो वाली
journey last night and then you are here today. It will give a great boost, moral boost, as well as the research capabilities, enhancement in the research capabilities of our scientists who are over here. I also welcome the guest of honor, Director of the Institute of Plasma Research, Dr. Shashank Chaturvedi Ji. Sir, we know that positions like this are very, very tough to come out of because each and every day something or the other comes out and we have to attend to that of these patients. But you have taken time, you have felt that something is there for us to share the knowledge that you have with our friends in the Crime Engineering Center at IIT. Thank you very much, sir, for being here this morning. We are also happy to receive and to welcome the guest of honor, Director of the Institute, uh, sir, officiating Director of IIT Khadgar. No, no, no. Director of the Institute, Director of the Institute of Plasma Research, Smith Soam.
that is still present in actual prison cells in which some of our martyrs were kept. If you have not visited, those who do not know, you should know and have a look at those cells as well. You should also go to the uh, women's cell as well and have a look at it. You might have heard that dietary Thalpur started in a, in a prison and it is true, you can see that. We have changed the first building which we have seen, the old building that we call there were all our uh, the, uh, the, you can say the martyrs, or all the people who were fighting for freedom. I would not say any other word for them, fighting for freedom of this country. They were housed in that, where we have our old building, many of the old things are there. We have the museum which we have, we call that the Sahib Dhawan, because two of them were shot dead there only. There were other cells for the women and men, we have taken out one of the cells, but a representative cell of 20 are kept only to show to all the generations. In fact, I was a student here, when Professor Patro was here, Professor uh, Sarangi must have also seen the gallows were here. In fact, um, I was slightly naughty, so I went inside the gallows and saw that how this body must be going. I remember that was totally horrendous, but we, we could go and see inside that how they Friends, I can tell you that we started from a humble beginning because the government of India at that time thought that something of higher level must be started on the lines of AMIP. We had that time 224 teacher, uh, students and 142 teachers only. A ratio of something of the similar order which MIT has. Today we have more than 15,000. To be very precise, 15,216 students on the campus. We are yet to get the first year students who are likely to come towards the first week of November 2022. We have about 800 faculty. We have close to a similar number of the uh, staff. When we were students, when Professor Sarangi, Professor Patru were a student at that time, the number was quite high of the staff. But because of the policy taken by the government of India of 10 to 1 is to 1.1, I think the number is very close to 900 or so for the non teaching staff. The various schools, department centers, ours is the largest institute which had about 300 acres. I was told by the dean and director, Professor Chopra, who is no more, he had told me that we had more than 3,000 acres of uh, less campus, but people have um, uh, taken or somehow some establishments have come and all that, but today we have 2100 which we say. The total length of the roads of this campus are uh, 60 kilometers. This, this, this campus is a beautiful campus. People may think, but I tell you this is a beautiful campus. We have about 52 department centers and schools and primarily in the center is one of them. It's one of the unique centers which were started in 1976. And there was the requirement at that time, that's why the government of India and the government by the administration at I Kharagpur at that time thought of. And we carved out professors from, I remember a professor uh, from physics department who started, uh, I think that's from Sathura, Sathura. He was there when we were students at that time. I was a student from 74 to 79, to 76 it was started. And people were carved from different departments, uh, physics departments, uh, physics department, mechanical engineering department, chemical engineering department, materials and all that. In order to see that best could be done for the materials at low temperature. Now the center has, if you see the work done in the center, I think our faculty colleagues have done a lot. Many of our faculty colleagues, I don't know whether Professor Chaudhary is here or not, but he has been uh, consulting in various industries and giving very told by the industries that Professor Sarangi Chaudhary has been doing a good job so far as the industries are concerned and the, uh, and the experience that he has gathered. Our students 
facilities that all the senior students have in the center and the teachers is great. And I think for that, each of the heads of the departments, now uh, Dr. Ben Maharaj is there, I think there needs to be collaborated for that. I know that the details of uh, this particular symposium will be given by one of them and they will give you as to what are the details of the symposium, how they are going to be, uh, have deliberations for various uh, parameters or various department. 
hydrogen liquefaction, dilution refrigerator, storage vessel, gas production, superconductivity, magnets, devices, energy storage, etc., etc. Also, we need to focus on academic institutes who should give more focus on to understand the basic science and engineering and applied work related to cryogenics and superconductivity. The industries can play a very important role in this. Also, Government of India can look into having more institutes, more centers of research in cryogenic engineering and superconductivity. Unless the industries and academic institute work together, the Atmanirbhar Bharat may not happen in this field. I urge the authorities in atomic energy, ISRO for the same. While today it is trendy that everybody is running after artificial intelligence and machine languages, in most academic institute, the core engineering and the science branches need to be nurtured. Otherwise, we may land up in a vacuum in these core branches or core research. On behalf of ICC, I am thankful to Cryogenic Center and Director IIT Kharagpur for organizing this NSCS 28. Such conferences play a very important role in shaping the minds of the young researchers who will cherish these memories in their life the way I did. During these three days, I asked them to meet professors, researchers, and discuss their research problems with them. Also, do visit the stalls where you might find, you may find, you may be able to see the hardware many times, and otherwise other details also. I am sure at the end of this symposium, you would have got and some future possibilities during these three days. Atre for the really motivating words, and as we have seen that he has given us such a comprehensive idea and the knowledge about how cryogenics is affecting all our livelihood in the development of the technology and science. I'm sure the students, the engineers from the industries and the young scientists and engineers would be taking up this cryogenics for the, for the further development of this science and technology. And I thank Professor Atre again to highlight the contribution of the Indian Cryogenic Council in this path. Thank you again. Now I would request the guest of honor the Director of Variable Energy Cyclones on Center, Dr. Sumit Som, to deliver his address. Respected Dr. Somanath, Chairman Isro, Professor Tiwari, Director IIT Kharagpur, Dr. Chaturvedi, Director IPR, Professor Atre, President ICC, and uh, also the uh, chairman of this uh, organizing committee of NSCS, Professor Benny Madhavji, distinguished guests, participants, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, a very good morning to all of you. And uh, I would like to thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity to say a few words in this forum, this is NSCS 28. As you know, in the 19th century, this uh, cryogenics was developed by uh, liquefying the gas. And then in 1911, the superconductivity, it, it was a breakthrough uh, discovery. Since then, the, uh, there was some, some uh, subdued research on superconductivity was going on. But in this uh, 20th century and, and now in the 21st century, the superconductivity, because of this, uh, basic science researchers, they have a great demand of high energy particle accelerator and high intensity particle accelerator. So for that, the superconductivity and cryogenics is a, now it has become a, uh, for energy frontier accelerator, it is now the, almost the mandatory because otherwise it is very difficult to achieve the goal. For example, in a large hadron collider, just now uh, Professor Atre mentioned, that in large hadron collider there is a uh, then, uh, 7 TV uh, beam and uh, this is a 27 kilometer circumference uh, collider and 7 TB beam and e for that, you need a high field magnet of the order of 8.33 Tesla. And that uh, to achieve this 8.33 Tesla, 
you have to have the about 12,000 ampere of current to flow through the conductor. And now to do that, you need a, uh, this uh, superconducting material. So in that case, niobium titanium and operating at 2K, even if it is uh, working, if it is operated in 4.5K, then you can only pass uh, 6,000 ampere of current. So in that case, you can achieve about six Tesla. So for to achieve 8.33 Tesla, you have to uh, use this uh, superconductivity and that too is a 2K helium temperature, liquid helium temperature. So now, uh, in, in so accordingly, they have made this uh, superconducting magnet. And uh, in this context, I, I would like to mention that in, in India, the highest uh, superconducting magnet that is available, that is working, operating at VCC, that is 5.5 Tesla. This is the large, I'm talking about the large size accelerator magnet and operating uh, round the clock. So this magnet is 5.5 uh, uh, Tesla and this is a superconducting magnet of niobium titanium. And in VCC, uh, there is also for this, uh, to achieve this uh, cryogenic, you need a cryogenic system cryogenic plant, so in VCC, the cryogenic plant uh, up to, there are three cryogenic plants, maximum is 540 watt at 4.5K. And, and uh, then uh, I was talking about this LHC, that, that uh, cryogenic system is also a very huge cryogenic system. And, and uh, now, besides the superconducting magnet, cryogenic system is required for uh, the superconducting RF cavity, as I have already told that you need, as the basic science researcher, they need the high energy as well as high intensity uh, beam. So uh, you cannot uh, use this uh, normal conducting copper, conduct, copper cavity because you need a very high gradient, accelerating gradient. And that is why you need a superconducting cavity. So to achieve that, you also need uh, this uh, cryogenics and superconductivity. And for example, in I and, and other, other than accelerator, there are also the fusion reactors. Uh, as you know, ICHAR, I think uh, probably uh, Dr. Chaturvedi may mention that I just uh, touch upon that in ICHAR also, there is a huge uh, superconducting, this, this huge uh, superconductivity means cryogenic plant is required. It is of the order of kilowatt, 7.5 kilowatt uh, level uh, cryogenic plant at 4.5 K. And, and there are three type, three uh, such cryogenic plants. And if you consider the storage of liquid helium, liquid nitrogen and plants, it takes about 8,000 square meter of area, almost a soccer field. So, uh, uh, so that kind of huge uh, potentials are there in cryogenics and superconductivity. And uh, uh, with this, I think uh, for all these purposes, you require a huge cryogenic facility consisting of cryo plant, liquid helium storage, liquid nitrogen storage, cold boxes, transfer lines, cryostats, electronic control system, automated safety interlock system, etc. Therefore, in summary, the future cryogenics and superconductivity has a huge potential for advanced basic science research space, medical applications, etc., and all these require specialized engineering skills in multidisciplinary engineering. So there is a huge potential. So I conclude with the mention that the Higgs particle, you know that Higgs particle was discovered, so this could not be possible. The discovery of Higgs particle could not be possible if there were no cryogenics and superconductivity. So with this, I wish the, uh, this conference, this uh, symposium, a grand success. Thank you. Jai Hind. What an educative address, sir. Now, I think now we are all the more educated about the role of superconductivity and cryogenics in general. Thank you, sir, once again. Now, I would like to invite the guest of honor, the director of Institute of Plasma Research, Dr. Shashank Chaturvedi, to please deliver the address. Thank you. 
ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಸೋಮನಾಥ್ ಚೇರ್ಮನ್ ಹೆಸರು ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ತಿವಾರಿ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ಆತ್ರೆ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಸುಮಿತ್ ಸೋಮ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ವೆನಿ ಮಾಧವ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದ ಆರ್ಗನೈಸರ್ಸ್ ಡಿಸ್ಟಿಂಗ್ವಿಷ್ ಪಾರ್ಟಿಸಿಪೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಅ ಪ್ಲೇಜರ್ ಟು ಬಿ ಪ್ರೆಸೆಂಟ್ ಅಟ್ ದಿಸ್ ಬಿಗ್ ಗ್ಯಾದರಿಂಗ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಕ್ರಾಜನಿಕ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಸೂಪರ್ ಕಂಡಕ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ಕಮ್ಯುನಿಟಿ ಇನ್ ಇಂಡಿಯಾ ವಿಚ್ ಫಾರ್ ಅ ವೆರಿ ಲಾಂಗ್ ಟೈಮ್ ಹೆಸ್ ಬೀನ್ ಟೇಕಿಂಗ್ ಅಪ್ ಕಟಿಂಗ್ ಏಜ್ ಆರ್ ಎಂಡ್ ಡಿ ಇನ್ ಅ ವೆರೈಟಿ ಆಫ್ ಏರಿಯಾಸ್ ಐ ವುಡ್ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಟು ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪ್ರೆಸ್ ಮೈ ಗ್ರಾಟಿಟ್ಯೂಡ್ ಟು ದ ಆರ್ಗನೈಸರ್ಸ್ ಫಾರ್ ಗಿವಿಂಗ್ ಮಿ ದಿಸ್ ಆಪರ್ಚುನಿಟಿ as i learned recently from dr rg shima <coughs> the first symposium on cryogenics was held at iit kharagpur in 1975 the next year saw the birth of the indian journal of cryogenics and also the start of the present cryogenic engineering center at iit kharagpur so in a way this symposium has simply come home again cryogenics is not my own area of work but my institute the institute for plasma research has been one of the big users of these technologies and systems in india as you know the indian fusion and plasma research community have been working closely with the cryogenics and superconductivity community in the country over the past two decades as a result of the synergy between government organizations the private sector and academia the program has major accomplishments to its credit this includes the setting up and long term operation of a large cryo plant and a cryo distribution system for the sst1 tokamak auxiliary systems the operation of superconducting magnets with a significant indigenous component the indigenous development of range of cryogenic and superconducting technologies and supply of a first of a kind large cryo systems for the eater mega project and so on we have recently worked out a 25 year three pronged road map for the expansion of this program of the fusion and plasma science program in the country this road map includes indigenous development of the complete range of fusion reactor technologies setting up and uh, of larger and more complex tokamaks and also what we call directed basic research aimed at futuristic technologies realization of this road map will require a sustained focused effort by the entire cryo and superconducting community in india with special emphasis on cryogenics and indigenous development i am sure the deliberations in this symposium will help to identify collaborations and make a contribution to indigenous technology development for atmanirbhar bharat thank you thank you very much sir and now we have understood about the role of the fusion energy in the development of the cryogenic engineering as well as the country thank you once again sir now with a great pleasure i have the honor to invite the chief guest of this symposium the isro chairman dr a somnath to deliver his address good morning all of you honorable director of uh, iit kharagpur and uh, distinguished persons on the dais and of the dais delegates invitees my greetings to you all on the occasion of this 28th symposium on cryogenics and superconductivity i'm really honored to come to this institute first iit kharagpur this is my first visit here do i have heard quite a bit about iit kharagpur and also i met many alumni alumni from here who be part of our organization and interacted with them so i was looking forward to come here of course it was finding it extremely difficult to find a time and slot for coming and professor datta was so insistent that i should come and then uh, so i could make it though there is a launch getting ready for la- on 22nd so we were tied up for that part still i'm very happy that today i could be on the land of the old generation iit still going very young uh, i'm really part happy to be part of your journey and also a part of this uh, symposium on cryogenics and superconductivity which is something which is very close to us and also dear to us in in the community of rocket engineers I myself not a cryogenic specialist but I happen to be a director of liquid propulsion system center which dealt with cryogenic engineering of course with a background in aer- aer- aeronautics aerospace engineering I could understand that and do something in the development of cryogenic engine uh, along with Dr Narayan and his team way back in 2014 and later it became successful engine and that is what getting ready for launch in the coming days for its fourth attempt of the cryogenic engine and the stage through that journey we understood quite a bit about cryogenics and its impact on various activities that we do uh, 
designing, developing cryogenic engine and stage requires complex understanding of interaction of cryogenics with the uh, materials, uh, analysis, uh, routines, testing, then uh, design of uh, facilities and infrastructure to deal with testing and qualification of various subsystems, et cetera, et cetera. I think that con journey still continues, even understanding cryogenic systems to meet our, uh, the current launch itself is a very complex problem we, we are addressing uh, today. And, and I will tell you this very simple problem, which will be maybe a very interesting topic to you, is what we, all of us, myself, Narayan and his team are addressing recently, is the behavior of liquid hydrogen in a huge tank, a very small quantity of hydrogen is left behind. And when we are moving the tank in the space in various directions, and uh, it is made to move, what will be the behavior of the fluid inside? And how the heat transfer between the fluid and the tank will determine the evolution of pressure inside? And how much of the liquid will get gasified and how much of the liquid will remain at the bottom for us to do a certain functionality in the rocket during its, uh, that regime? It's a very complex problem with, with regard to uh, duration, it takes almost uh, an hour. I think it's almost an hour. This process will continue in orbit, and uh, and uh, we w we are trying to understand how the external heating uh, through the insulation will get into the tank, and how the liquid will move in a zero gravity environment, uh, and how it, the accelerations present in the thrusters in the stage will make the mo liquid move towards the acquisition point, and how the thrusters can still continue to get liquid. All these are the very complex problem having no practical testing feasibility even in the ground. And we are going to do this uh, in mission for the first time. So we went on understanding, trying to understand from the various perspective of computational fluid dynamics and also the previous flight data to understand this, m the behavior of the fluid in the previous flight and correlate all of this and take certain, certain informed decision on proceeding with the mission. So this is the level of complexity that is faced in front of us for a simple problem obviously looking problem for cryogenics. Uh, and especially uh, dealing with liquid hydrogen, all of you know, those who are in the domain realize that it is something very, very difficult. So I also understand that the domain of cryogenics not only spreads in, the doma in, in rocket technology, but also in various other domains as well as already been told in building complex systems and facilities for scientific activities, commercial activities, food preservation, life uh, sciences, uh, high energy cyclotron work or even for plasma research as we have, uh, they have already mentioned to you. Uh, the collaboration in this domain is what makes us stronger. This is something which I understood, especially in building large infrastructure and facilities for us. The support that has been given by many industries in India who are in this domain and also technologists who have been advising us, helping us in terms of understanding these systems so that we make complex facilities for our propulsion system testing very safely. The journey last 25 years or so in cryogenics has really proved that we are able to build uh, big facilities uh, for testing uh, engines and subsystems in IPRC at uh, Mahendragiri, way f far away near the southern tip of India, and also at our launch complex where we service cryogenic systems for filling our rockets and systems. So, Many of them came from outside in the, in the beginning. And over the years, we were able to develop industries in India who are able to build such systems within India and then supply to us. This is something really great. And I would like, some of them are already there, part of your exhibitors and uh, sponsors for this program. So my congratulations to you for enabling this transition from building, you know, from bringing from outside to build it in India. Uh, with your own knowledge and skill, that is really extraordinary. Some of them are wonderful work, which are as world-class as that we earlier used to get. As we, th we think that the cryogenic knowledge also in us uh, grew from the earlier works of our, some of our pioneers in the 1970s, when they started trying to mix hydrogen and oxygen to create a fl uh, flame. From that, in the last many years, we were able to grow to, to a level that we are now building our next generation rocket engines having 200 tons of thrust in semi cryogenic engine. And maybe Dr. Narana will tell you how we are trying to develop our new class of engines using liquid methane and oxygen, liquid oxygen. So we are working on these domains and uh, all your support is required basically to keep us, you uh, know, this research and development activity in ISRO to flourish and grow. 
And I am also equally happy to see the similar happening in outside this room. Startups and you know, young entrepreneurs coming up to develop semi-cryogenic engines in India. That means they are also going to handle uh, cryogenic fluids in their facilities and they are also learning how to design uh, complex flow problems related to cryogenic fluids, heat transfer issues, materials, etc., etc., to develop such rocket engines in, the, in, in, in industries outside India, outside this room. I think this is also a very uh, interesting thing to happen. And students from IIT Kharagpur, I believe, especially from this center, will be sought after in such domains. And I, I, I tell you that today, these conferences of this nature are really created the, a critical mass in, in cryogenic engines, engineering technology in India for us to support in research establishment as well as in industries. I congratulate the, the Indian Cryogenic Council for steering this activity and also the institutions who have at least some say in cryogenic technology to be part of this movement and uh, for organizing this conference, uh, 28th edition of this conference in IIT Karakpur, my greetings to each one of you for taking this happen even after the long spell of COVID. You were all able to come and then meet and then discuss. And I was just going through some of the abstracts that are being set for discussions today, tomorrow, etc. So really happy to note that there is a good particip participation from ISRO as well in some of the work that we did uh, and also from many other institutions uh, across the uh, country. Uh, so take this opportunity to find some time to visit your cryogenic facilities and labs, uh, which actually produces the best of the brains that are required for the country for the future. Wishing you all the very best for this conference and look forward to productive outcome out of this and also uh, fruitful collaborations to come out of your meeting each other. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. How beautifully he said at the uh, about the space cryogenics and also his patronizing words for the young entrepreneurs and the students of the cryogenic engineering in general and especially the cryogenic engineering center of IIT Kharagpur. Thank you once again, sir. Now, uh, a glorious moment has come that in recognition of the great achievements and the notable contributions, the Indian Cryogenic Council bestows lifetime achievement awards to various stalwarts in the cryogenic engineering of our country. Now, I would request Professor Mirin Atre to kindly conduct the award-giving ceremony for the Lifetime Achievement Award. For this, I would request Kirtana, Jyoti, and Malika to assist to conduct the program, please. Thank you very much. <coughs> Indian Cryogenics Council <coughs> gives this award as a Lifetime Achievement Award, which is one of the prestigious awards. This award is given to those who, has, who have contributed to the field of cryogenics, both nationally, both in India as well as on an international level. In addition, the awardee sh should have contributed to the growth of cryogenics in India and in particular also to the Indian Cryogenics Council. There have been many such contenders to these awards who have given more than 30 years to this field. And ICC would like to express its gratitude by felicitating such persons by giving them these Lifetime Achievement Awards. A committee is formed to consider to recommend such persons. And after the recommendation, the, the EC, the Executive Committee, we got two persons who were recommended and by this committee of this year. And the awardees are Professor Kastri Rangan, ex-professor from IIC Bangalore. <laughs> Thank you. And the second person is uh, Professor T.S. Datta, currently visiting professor here at IIT Kharagpur. So first, I will like to invite uh, Professor Dr. Kasturangan. Uh, maybe I just read the citation and then you can come on the stage. So Indian Cryogenics Council, I'm reading the citation. The Indian Cryogenics Council is honored to present Lifetime Achievement Award 2022 to Dr. S. Kasturangan for his outstanding contribution in the field of low temperature physics and cryogenics. 
Professor Kasturangan has worked in several niche area of cryogenics such as helium-2 phase separators, fountain effect pumps, cryocoolers, cryosorption pumps, cryogenic instrumentation, and development of many cryogenic systems. For the first time in the country, a lowest temperature of 2.5 K was achieved by a two-stage pulse chip cryocooler using the indigenous rotary wall with a six kilowatt compressor. He developed electroacoustics purity monitors for helium gas as well as fast response hydrogen gas detectors. He developed adsorber characteriz characterization facility for activated charcoal in the temperature range of 4.2 to 77 Kelvin. The cryogenic deflashing facility at 77 Kelvin for rubber components developed by him has benefited several rubber industries. He has, he has assisted in initiating cryogenic research in many institutions through sponsored projects from various funding agencies. I request uh, Professor Kasturingan, he may come. And may I now invite uh, Professor Kasturingan to come on the stage and I request I cut up for director and Chairman Isro to please come forward. I request uh, IT Kharagpur Director. One minute to Professor Kasturangan to have a small exception. Just a minute, please. Yeah. <coughs> Good morning to you all. Uh, respected Dr. Somnath, Chairman Isro, Professor Tiwari, uh, Professor Shashank Chaturvedi, Dr. Som, and uh, Chairman of uh, the ICC and the president of ICC and the members of the audience, eminent professors, faculty members from different disciplines. It is indeed a great honor and privilege to me to have been here for being chosen for this Lifetime Achievement Award of the Indian uh, Cryogenic Council and uh, this has been indeed a very proud moment for me in my life and the dream come true to be here and receive this award from the <coughs> great people from this uh, cryogenic, probably this one of the highest award that anyone working in this area of cryogenics can get in this country. Although on the stage I have received the award, but there are many people who have been behind this who have made me come before you. And I would like to dedicate this award to my teachers, my mentors, students, project staff, and members of the administration, and above all, my family members who have been able to bear with me over, over the delays and over the times which I had spent in the institute without the, I sincerely thank ICC for all the uh, award, this thing, and I hope it will motivate all the youngsters. Thank you very much once again. The second awardee for the Lifetime Achievement Award is Professor T.S. Datta, currently visiting professor at IIT Kharagpur, alumnus of IIT Kharagpur, and also previously scientist at IUAC and before that at IG Car. Let me read the citation for Dr. T.S. Datta. Indian Cryogenics Council is honored to present Lifetime Achievement Award 
to Professor T. S. Datta for his outstanding contribution to the field, the field of cryogenics and applied superconductivity. He started his professional career in 1984 at IG Carr, Kalpakam, and has continued to enrich the growth of cryogenics and applied superconducti superconductivity in the country. He joined the Nuclear Science Center, now IUAC, where he led the cryogenics group in the development of cryogenic system consisting of large accelerators, large accelerating cryo models, test cryostats, cryogen distribution network for the superconducting LINAC at IUAC. He also led his group to various R&D programs on applied superconductivity such as cryo-free magnet, MRI magnet system, and SFCL. Besides scientific contribution, Professor, Doc, Professor Datta has worked hard to make the Indian Cryogenics Council a vibrant organization. He has created a niche for himself among the cryogenic community in India and abroad. May I request Professor T.S. Datta to come on the stage, please. And I can give only one minute to Professor Datta. Please. Yeah, I'll not take more than one minute. I sincerely thank jury committee, first of all, and then ICC to approve my name Lifetime Achievement Award. I think there are a list of persons directly or indirectly associated on my activity and come to these positions. I sincerely thank to everybody. And last but not the least, my family, who allowed me to spend more than office hours time in the office. So I sincerely thanks <laughs> my family. OK, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you and congratulations to all the awardees. Um, now, uh, no event of this magnitude is possible without the support of the administration as well as many other who are involved to make this success. So I would now request the chairman of NSC 28 to kindly deliver the vote of thanks. Professor Adam, please. Thank you, Poitra. Dignity is on the stage. Chief Guest, uh, uh, Chairman I Servo, our Director, and uh, Director IPR, Shashankji, and uh, Sumit Sumji, VCC, and uh, all the dignitaries, my colleagues, faculty members, students, everyone here. I just want to tell you very important that, you know, after a long time we are meeting, that's good. So this is not a simple conference for all the Kaiser community today. It's actually a celebration for us. Next two, three days is going to be a celebration for us. And this celebration is not possible without the help of many, many people. And particularly, I should thank our director, IIT Karakpur. Many, many times have I went to him. Uh, we have been postponing the, you know, uh, the event, 1920, 21, 22. And he has been very kind to us, and he has supported entirely. 
And uh, without him, it is not possible. Thanks a lot, sir. Um, and the chief guest, Sumnath Ji, because he has a very, very important program to go on 22nd, 23rd, in spite of his busy, busy schedule. And he is here with us, and he's delivered a very, very important uh, lecture for all the cryogenic community over here. So thank you very much, sir. Uh, and our guest of honor, Shashank Ji and uh, Sumit Somji for being here and uh, uh, with us today and for giving their speech. And we have plenary lectures. Uh, Sumnat Ji, Shashank Ji and John Islan and uh, Takana Bokis and Rajesh Harish are going to deliver the uh, uh, plenary lecture, uh, plenary uh, talk today, today and tomorrow as it's going to come. Thank you very much for uh, all the uh, people agreed and going to deliver the lectures. And then uh, the, in the instructions of uh, yesterday's uh, 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 short-term course that took place, uh, uh, Professor uh, Messi Choreski, Takanabukis, Professor Sunil Sarangi, and Professor Ajay Shema. Thank you very much for, and also the packed hall and then, you know, uh, complete uh, question answer sessions, Students have been, well, it's, a, it's excellent uh, yesterday, the question answer sessions went very good and very highly appreciated. I know that, you know, cryogenics, uh, we get very, very uh, less number of students and all this stuff is sent, but, but those who come, they're highly dedicated and they're cool and highly energetic. That's very, very good and they're, they're mad about cryogenics. So that's, that's what makes us very, very special. And uh, I thank all the uh, Lifetime Achievement Awardees who came with the families and uh, it's very pleasure to meet all of them, uh, both of them. Uh, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you. Uh, and I thank all the invited speakers, national and international delegates, and uh, industrial delegates, exhibitors, sponsors particularly, all of them, we thank you very much without that. It's, it's not uh, uh, easy for us to plan this big celebrations actually. And I thank uh, the deputy director whenever we go. He is always with a big smile and lots and lots of encouragement. Professor Amit Patra, it's, it's been so pleasure. Uh, you know, <laughs> every time I go to your room, it's fantastic. Thank you very much for all the encouragement you gave us. Register for all, I, we thank the register for giving all the necessary permissions. Everything was in time and very, very thankful to us. Thank you very much. And we thank the dean uh, uh, and associate dean of outreach for their kind support and guest house and the hall management for hassle-free accommodation for all the uh, dignitaries and, and also the, uh, the, all the delegates, students, everything took care. Thank you very much. Uh, particularly, one more thing is that the Computer Information Center for all the networking without communication, not possible today. So I thank uh, the, the, the Computer Information Center. Vikram Silla Complex to be thanked, very, very important place for us. We are all meeting here. We are have, having fun today and tomorrow. And for the operation and the maintenance, support in, the, in all the venues. We have uh, parallel sessions going on, so everything is taken care. So we, we thank all of that. Uh, and the civil construction, maintenance section, electrical, mechanical workshop section, security section, refrigeration, air condition section, sanitary section, horticulture section, video, audio uh, uh, section, transport section, and the waterworks for necessary infrastructure facility and the maintenance, thanks a lot. And we also thank uh, the Nehru Museum, uh, Science and Technology for agreeing to open uh, this for our delegates who are going to visit in the next one or two days. And, uh, we, 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 and I want to thank the, all the patents, National Advisory Committee, National Organizing Committee, Local Organizing Committee, and the subcommittees, all the people who have put their effort in making this event a big one. And particularly, and, and, and lost, but not, uh, and one more thing is that, you know, our cryogenic engineering center, the staff, and the big thumbs up to all of our students, the uh, student volunteers, and all the students who have made this event, you know, to come to this place, and then next two days is going to be very, very delightful. I thank all of you uh, for all your contribution. Big thanks to the students and, and the cryogenic staff. And, but last but not the least, this is very important. Without this, things would not happen, that is ICC. They gave us the opportunity to, to conduct this in, in, in Ida Kharagpur, and I thank Prasate and, and ICC a lot, because through this interaction and everything, we have learned a lot, because after a long time, we are conducting this conference. I know previously this was done in IIT Kharagpur, but after a long time, we are, we, we are coming here. Uh, uh, conference has come to Kharagpur IIT. Uh, we have uh, the Cryogenic Engineering Center, though very, very, very frequently we need to have this here, but it's, it's happened now. And
very soon it's going to have, we have, we're going to have more of these conferences here. And thanks to ICC and uh, all, the, uh, all the support they have and appreciation and everything was fantastic. And uh, with that, you know, I'm going to say thanks one and all. And uh, I think next is going to be the national anthem. We are, uh, just to say, we are about to uh, come to the close of the inauguration. Let me make a few announcements. Uh, uh, there will be one inauguration of the exhibitions, uh, which will are going to be held out just outside this auditorium in the foyer. And after that, at 11.15, uh, we shall be reassembling here uh, for the plenary talks. And we are very fortunate to have our chief guest himself, uh, Dr. S. Somnath, to be one of the plenary speakers and then we have Dr. Shashank Chaturvedi and from Kyushu University Japan we have Dr. Takanobu Kis for the plenary lectures so we sh for that we shall be assembling at 11.15 right in this auditorium and between the uh, plenary uh, talks and the exhibition um, inauguration we have the high tea also arranged outside. So before we disperse to the exhibition hall let us all stand up for the national anthem please. जन गन मन अधिनायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता पंजाब सिंध गुजरात मराठा द्राविड उत्कल बंग विंद हिमाचल यमुना गंगा उच्छल जल धित रंग तब शुभ नामे जागे तब शुभ आशीष मागे गाहे तब जय गाथा जन गन मंगल नायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे जय 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 हे थैंक यू आई वुड नाउ रिक्वेस्ट द ऑल द डेलीगेट्स टू गो आउट फ्रॉम द टू साइड डोर्स एंड लेट दिस फ्रंट डोर बी ओपन फॉर द चीफ गेस्ट एंड अदर डिग्नेटरीज प्लीज I'm going to go to the next one. 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 I
Halo, halo cek We are going to start the session very soon. I request all the delegate students, everyone to come inside the auditorium. Hello, check. Check, check. Hello, check. Hello, uh, we are now ready to start the plenary speakers, please. Plenary lectures. All the delegates are requested to come inside and take the seats. And to conduct this session, I would request uh, Professor Sunil Sarangi and Professor T. S. Datta to kindly conduct the session. Kindly serve this. And a member of International Academy of Astronautics.
I have the honor of inviting Sri Somnath Ji on stage to present his lecture. Come on, come on. Thank you. Sir, you have approximately 40 minutes, and if you spare a part of it for questions, that will be nicer. You remove that. Unfortunately, the podium is not designed for talking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <coughs> okay. No, don't worry. I'll manage. No, no, I can't. Because it is too much back, back side. You know, it will take uh, my neck will go. Okay, so I'll speak from here. Okay. Is that, is that okay? That's okay, sir. So good morning, all of you, once again. Uh, sorry for the uh, hiccup. Uh, it's okay if when you do talk about complex problems, some small minor hiccups can always come up. You now. <coughs> Uh, so, uh, what I thought uh, is that I should speak all of you about the uh, Indian space program a little bit. And of course, I uh, should also speak about the cryogenic developments and its applications in ISRO. And I know many of you informed people here are already aware of what we do in cryogenics and what type of progress that we have made. And many, many of the distinguished people present here are already part of our journey of developing this system. They are part of our discussions, reviews. And many of you may have already knowing a bit of the work that we do. But then it is most for the delegates here and the, for the students who should uh, get inspired to take up some of these tasks at later part of their career. It will be, it'll be good that if that happens. So before I start on uh, topic, talking about cryogenics, I thought I should talk about some of the accomplishments of ISRO in various domains. Uh, and you are aware that our job is to launch satellites to space, make use of the satellites for missions which are very important, also take up high-end technological missions, and also do science, certain science missions within the limited budget that we have. We have accomplished the development of launch vehicles that we have today, launches taking place from our own soil for most of our satellites. We were also successful in launching almost 342 foreign satellites using our rockets from 34 countries, and also an array of science missions that all of you are familiar, like the Chandrayaan, Mangalayan, Megatropic, Saral, NISAR, which is going to come up, Krishna, as well as the future lunar missions that are in the offing. Similarly, we also did some of the developmental works related to crew escape system, which later uh, projected as a Gaganyan program that also you are aware, and also the reusable launch vehicle work that we do. In the satellite side, currently we have 53 satellites in orbit. Some of them are defunct, so I can tell you around 49 functioning satellites are there in uh, providing communication services across the country. Also, there's observation both in civilian and strategic domain. We also have the NAVIC satellites, eight of them, uh, and which are providing position timing services to the country. And also, the science missions, which uh, currently working, the Chandrayaan-2 is still there. Uh, is uh, still there and the Mars Orbiter mission recently had its uh, last day spent and we, after eight years of service and AstroSat continues to work and provide uh, excellent science outcome. In terms of communication, uh, the support that we give various sectors is really phenomenal. All your communication needs, especially wherever there is a space segment comes in, ISRO's support is there in terms of the transponders, that we provide to the public service uh, organizations as well as for the private companies. And we distribute to various people as already indicated in this slide. But what is more important is there is a migration from DTA services to high throughput services. That means internet services we started giving through our satellites now. The probably you would have noted that Hughes has already announced its services to internet services uh, to, uh, to not for individuals, but of course for organizations and limited groups of people. So this is one domain where we focus. 
but this is also changing and uh, in the future ISRO will not be doing this work and we have handed over this task to NSIL, the New Space India Limited who will do this work for us. Navigation service is limited to the Indian continent, it is called the regional navigation system and for this the the, it is primarily meant for our strategic community for ensured uh, and encrypted services for navigation but we also use it for civilian sector using uh, various devices that are developed into the vehicle systems, also into handheld devices and also to service, provide a lot of services in the coastal sectors and distress value services, etc. So our navigation service is not only providing signal but also can you do communication services. It can do uh, text signaling to various uh, group of people through our satellite. So this is another unique service and we are poised to expand this in the future uh, to far beyond Indian territory. This is another discussion currently we are having with the government. Of course on the scientific missions probably you are all aware the space science mission has been one of the very inspiring journey. Uh, it's not done by ISRO alone, it is done by various institutions of this country, institutions who have interest in science, exploration, etc. We make use of their knowledge and skill to develop instruments. We host them in our satellite along with our own instruments and then launch them. So the Chandrayaan-1, AstroSat and Mars Orbiter missions are examples of such collaboration that happened uh, with the various institutions of this country. And uh, currently Chandrayaan-3 is getting ready, it's almost ready and we are getting ready for launch. And so is Aditya L1 which is a mission to understand Sun looking from the Lagrangian point of L1. Now we, with this we have a fleet of rockets. Uh, the GSLV Mar 3 is the last of the development. SSLV, its last mission was a failure, but we are getting ready for its next launch soon. And uh, recently probably you have seen that we are uh, announcing a new heavier lift launch vehicle called NGLV, new generation rocket launch vehicle, which we are started working on, again on cryogenic propulsion. That is primarily based on methane and liquid oxygen as the engine and with a throttleable, reusable capability. So this is something that we are currently working on. Now let me go straight to some of the propulsion system developments with that introduction on what we have done, what we accomplished in ISRO. Maybe towards the end I will tell you something long term vision and future plans after going through the theme of the current today's talk. This is more into the cryogenic propulsion but let us look at the propulsion system in general. In rocket if you see we have all sort of things in ISRO, the solid, liquid, bipropellant, uh, monopropellant, the cryogenic, semi-cryogenic, storable hypergolic, all of them. So there are different teams across different places and especially in the launch vehicle centers having specialized in building machines uh, for uh, propulsion system. The solid boosters what we have developed S200 is one of the biggest uh, in the world, not the biggest but one of the largest rocket. The cryo, semi cryo testing facilities have we have developed over the years, also the servicing facilities at launch complex and the hypergolic system is the primary propulsion device even for liquid system today for satellites as well as launch vehicle and uh, this is though though it is not the part of today discussion I will not go much into the details of each of them but concentrate on some of the propulsion system for our rockets. The PSLV you are aware that it is a combination of solid and liquid uh, stages. The solid rocket comes out of the HTPB based propellant and the liquid stages the Vikas engine the four stage in uh, engine which is a pressure fed engine and also a composite propulsion uh, motor case with the solid motor are the key elements of the propulsion system of PSLV. So uh, you are aware that PSLV has clocked 50 plus successful launches so far. Then comes the GSLV Mark II we call it. Now we have removed all those Mark thing in out of this name we call just GSLV and uh, it contains the first time cryogenic engine because the cryogenic propulsion was necessary at that point in time when GSLV was developed it's because we are looking at placing geostationary satellites, satellites of mass approximately 2 tons to GTO. It was not possible by any other propulsion than cryogenic propulsion because the rocket needs to be, has to give approximately a velocity of 10 kilometers per second plus to the satellite and after that almost 5 kilometers or more is given by the cryogenic engine and stage. So it was not possible by any other propulsion system than cryogenic propulsion. 
Hence, the induction of the cryogenic stage happened in GSLV at that time. It started with the Russian engines and stages which we inducted initially into the program. Later, the engine of the Russian design was indigenized or we can say it is not indigenized, it is rather you know, understood. And then we built that engine in India. And the stage also was built in India and we started using that engine and stage for the subsequent mission successfully. Then comes the LVM3, the launch vehicle Mark III. Here the propulsion system is again a combination of solid, air storable liquid and cryogenics. So for this, when we started designing this rocket, we understood that it is not possible to design a four ton to GTO class of rocket with uh, the existing propulsion system. So we have to develop a new engine, cryogenic engine. Though there was ideas at that time to go for semi-cryogenic engine for the booster in place of hypergolic propellants, but then we thought that it is not a wise idea to create too many uh, uncertainties into the development of the rocket. So the semi-cryogenic engine was put as a second option and we co concentrated on developing a new engine called the C25. And uh, that was the key development. It took almost 12 years plus to reach a maturity level of that engine. And today we have this engine working beautifully along with the other two propulsion systems. But the stages, which we call engine, along with the rest of the system, we call it a stage, they were brand new. So the rocket is also a brand new rocket, which I had the fortune to be the project director when it made this maiden experimental flight. Now, if you look at the liquid engines and its heritage over the years in uh, LPSC, we start from uh, very low thrust to very high thrust range. All of them are designed within ISRO, manufactured using the facilities within the ISRO facilities as well as industries, and we were able to build in numbers for meeting our programs. It started from the monopropellant thrusters, which are, uh, which are used for satellites. Also, we have the electric propulsion thrusters of low thrust va value, which is, which is a 75 millimeter thruster, which is developed in India, and right up to the 800 kilonewton Vikas engine, which are currently operational. But we are in the process of developing a 2,000 kilonewton LOX ISRO scene engine for future semi-cryogenic engine usage. Now, if you look at each of these engines, the bipropellant engine of the Vikas, which is hypergolic engine, it is a heritage from the erstwhile Aryan development program where Indian people got associated with them and developed this engine in Paris. Uh, maybe the instead of Paris, I must say it is SCP. And then the engine technology was brought to India and this was indigenously realized in Indian industries. And it was taken there and, and, and uh, tested. Probably you would have read about the stories of uh, uh, of all the development programs in the, some of the recent books which are released. So this engine, even today, it is one of the workhorse engine for us. And this is powering PSLV, GSLV, GSLV Mark III. And we look at how to retire this engine. And that is the main discussion currently going on by inducting semi-cryogenic propulsion technology into the, in, into the rocket. But this is a beautiful engine. Uh, and we have currently, uh, in terms of production also, we are able to produce in numbers using in industry, Indian industries. Now comes a cryogenic engine called the CUS engine. The CUS engine is a uh, knowledge that we gained by working with the Russian engine. It's a very beautiful engine and I must say one of the most efficient semi-cryogenic engine having the, one of the highest ISPs of the world in this class of engines. Uh, a staged combustion engine having a very compact turbo pump and also a uh, regeneratively cooled thrust chamber. And this engine has its own steering engines. It's not a gimbalable engine, it's a fixed engine having its control system working using another set of two engines which will do the maneuvering of the whole stage uh, along with uh, uh, its complex system was understood by our engineers and we could reproduce this engine to its satisfaction through a complex uh, development program which lasted almost 20 years. So today with that knowledge only we could go and build the future engines for ISRO. The, then comes the CE20 engine which is used in GSLA Mark III. This engine is a gas generator cycle engine, and it has a, so you can see a gas generator cycle engine has its own exhaust, uh, an additional exhaust you can see because it is not dumped into the main thrust chamber unlike a staged combustion cycle engine. And uh, the turbo pumps, uh, the, all the equipments for it are actually designed by our team at LPSC and manufactured in the Indian industries. And we could test and qualify it over a period of time. And uh, this, I must say this is one, though in, in terms of 
specific impulse typically a gas generator cycle engine will not have a specific impulse on the cus engine but for the purpose of simplicity manufacturability low cost and minimum risk of development we adopted the gas generator cycle for going for c20 engine and the next engine we are developing is a semi cryogenic engine we call it sc200 or 2000 sometimes we call it 200 sometimes 2000 I don't know, Dr. Narayana sometimes will call it 2000 in terms of the SI units. But then this is a, an engine which we got it from the knowledge of working with the Russians again. Today the Ukrainians, not the Russians, okay. So the knowledge from this engine came from there and uh, the currently the development process is on. I must tell you this is one of the complex manufacturing uh, system that we have ever encountered in the manufacturing of the engines, primarily because of the extreme high pressure which is involved in this engine. Typically, the some of the pressures here goes uh, all as much as 600 bar, uh, if I am correct, yes. And uh, and this pressures creates problem for sealing, joints, uh, also the flow velocities which are encountered in the engines, especially liquid hydrogen flows, the metal combustion issues, the surface coating related issues, sealing issues, uh, and uh, the strength of material which are required. So for this engine, we were asked to develop almost 40 plus new alloys and materials in India. And we could develop all these alloys, manufacture uh, engines to some level of completeness today. So we are getting ready for the first of the firing of the powerhead part of this engine soon. And uh, probably today in later part of the discussion, uh, the director of IPRC, Mahendri Dei, will tell you about the facilities that are being built for testing these engines, massive and huge facilities to handle such a powerful engine. Another important point is to look at the testing of these engines. This is a, again an interesting thing to understand how a cryogenic engine testing is such a complex activity. The engine itself is a complex system, but testing engine is yet another complex system. I think probably you will hear about such tests, such details later. Specifically in terms of stor storage of cryogenic liquids, its preparation of the, the, the facilities to lead up to the engine admission, the the chronology of uh, the operation of the facilities, et cetera, becomes very important and it comes out through a lot of analysis and trials and instrumentation skills which are required to ensure safe starting of the cryogenic engine. So I must tell you this is another great development in, in ISRO in terms of handling these engines for testing purpose in ground. Stage is much more simpler, the rocket once it is inside it is much more simpler but then testing an engine in ground is actually much more challenging than flying it uh, really in flight. I think those who work with this cell only will understand my statement may not be really be understood except for some people who are present here. Now if you really look at the cryogenic engine uh, you will understand there are many key elements of this engine. The first and foremost is the the thrust chamber where the thrust combustion takes place the thrust is developed. The crux of the problem is to get the right type of atomization of the liquid oxygen and fuel and also to ensure the heat distribution within the chamber are safe within the material limits that you don't develop hot spots, you don't damage the hardware. The throat where the uh, high temperature exists, the material doesn't yield and we need a great amount of thermostructural analysis to achieve that. The pressures within chambers, uh, the passages are well within safe limits and all the engines are, thrust chambers are made out of by uh, layered structures where passage of the fluid between these layers ensure cooling of the chamber. The inside typically are copper and externally steel, steel materials. And the, the passage design is the most critical part of this engine. And this is something that we have worked over the years to perfect it, especially in case of C25 engine. Another complexity is in terms of turbo pumps. Probably you know the turbo pumps are one of the most powerful turbo pumps compared to its power to mass ratio. The cryogenic engine for CUS, for example, it's a one megawatt power uh, generated inside for a mass of hardly uh, less than 100 kilogram. So in a, if a turbo pump of that compactness is to be made with one end at very extremely high temperature and another end at liquid hydrogen, having sealing system running on a single shaft, it's a very complex system. So the complexities lies in designing and development of the sealing system. Uh, also the, uh, the thermal and the material related problems which will be encountered while it's when it goes to the transients of the heat transfer and also in the steady state. So the whole design of this in terms of distortion that can happen with the temperature variations, the pressure uh, across different fluids, sealing requirements for safety of the system, etc., etc. So 
these issues were addressed over a period of time through very consistent efforts in testing subsystem by subsystem and perfecting it over a period of time. So this is something complexities which is to be understood in engine design. If you look at the cryogenic cast engine turbo pump assembly, I will tell you one simple example. This whole engine is a welded engine, so there are no joints in this. The entire assembly has to be welded step by step to achieve certain tolerances. And the entire shaft is a single shaft with uh, uh, mounted on multiple bearings. So you can understand a manufacturer's challenge in getting a turbine which is fully welded with certain tolerances of alignment and uh, a small variation in the welding process, the rate at which you weld on one joint can damage the entire in, uh, engine. That means the thermal distortions which are introduced due to the welding can also create the entire engine to cease. And this you will not only in flight, it will not know in ground because there is no possibility to test it uh, to the fullest in the ground. So that's a challenge of manufacturing and this is perfected by lot of trials and you know, experience that are gained by the team over the years. Even with that, we had problems of some of the engines getting rejected and then has to be re-corrected. You know, I think probably Narayan can explain sometimes when you discuss with him. <coughs> Another, another point is testing them in isolation. See, if, suppose you want to test engines as a total engine. It is very easy because you need to admit hydrogen and oxygen and also go through the sequence of admission of fluids. But if you have to test each of the turbo pumps separately, you need to create facilities to drive them. So the driving systems and uh, pumping demonstration and developing characteristics of each of the pumps and turbines is a very complex problem. And for this, special facilities are to be created for each of the subsystems. So this is another work our testing team at Mahindragiri did and also it requires complex analysis with respect to thermostructural again, the feed systems, etc, cetera, etc cetera, which are involved and also the instrumentation which are required in this to capture the behavior to analyze it for the correction or improvements which are required. So for a small power engine this may not be a problem but the power of the engine when it increases it becomes much bigger problem. So for the, all this engine development Big facilities have come up in Mahindragiri, one, one of them being the high altitude test facility where you can do the engine testing in uh, high altitude facility, basically the low, lower pressures which are achieved through ejector system and vacuumization. And we also have created uh, facilities called main engine test stand facilities where the engine can be tested in atmospheric conditions with throat closures and also uh, facilities where the exit uh, separation of the flow can be prevented by appropriate uh, design of the, the pressure fields using water injection and then engine exit. Now let me show the cryogenic stage, the cusp stage which is used for GSLV is again a assemblage of various systems. The engine of course is a very complex system, along with that we have the liquid hydrogen tank, liquid oxygen tank and the structures which connects these tanks. The complexity here are the thermal behavior of each of these hardwares. And also every pipeline that connects from the tank to the engine has to be designed for a thermostructural behavior for transient behavior as well as steady state conditions. So we need to look at how the dilation affects contraction, how it will affect each of the joints, how stresses will develop, what displacements can be tolerated, how to off offload or not to create uh, attachment stresses at joints. Same is the case with the structures which connects the liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen tank. And you know that each of the liquid will be filled at various time, it, they are not filled together. So when the liquid hydrogen tank is filled, some other tanks are empty. So you will have a different temperature gradients corresponding to different conditions, both in ground as well as in flight. So the entire hardware has to be designed looking at the time, time scales of operations of the stages. So, so it is not simply designing it for one temperature, it is to design for a time temperature evolution of the hardware to handle uh, structural systems. So the cryogenic upper stage after all this development was successfully launched during 2014, 5th January was the first launch of the indigenous cryogenic stage which the very first launch was successful. Now coming to C25, C25 is again a, again a similar to cusp stage but much simpler in its complexity. Primarily coming out of the part that it is not a staged combustion engine and it is a gas generator engine and hence there are no booster pumps in this tanks. The difference between the cryogenic upper stage and the C25 is that the tanks are operating at a higher pressures. So the sup supply of the liquids to the pumps are handled at a higher pressure, hence the net positive suction head for the pumps are assured there. Whereas in 
the cryogenic upper stage of GSLV, we have to have booster pumps to pump the liquids to the prime pu pumped primary pumps. Hence, the tanks are operated at a lower pressure, and tanks have to be strengthened, stiffened to handle low pressure conditions and buckling. And all those complexities are avoided in C25, and stage is much more simpler. But the um, impact is that it will have a little more weight than custage, hence the lower efficiency. But then we were able to successfully design all those stage and uh, structures. But here the complexity in C25 cannot be explained in one slide like this. But we went through very complex structural design problems of handling such a stage and engine and uh, qualified them through a very testing process, which, uh, which is a subject to talk for another you know, com community itself. Let me also talk about control components. When you talk about cryogenic engine, you'll think that the engine is the most complex part, but then equally complex are control components. The control components are the artwork of a mechanical engineer, I must tell you. Those who know this system, they will understand that very precision hardwares using varieties of materials are designed to handle electro-pneumatic activities. For example, the cusp command block which you see, the star-like item, is the heart of the whole system. Where when you give an electrical command, a solenoid operate to, oper to admit helium gas to various parts of the stage and engine to open another set of pneumatic valves. So this item can work only when the very precision and uh, aspect of this is handled very carefully. And leaks are not to be avo avoided. And there should be redundancy in actuation of all of this. And these are sealed in containers to ensure that there are no humidity getting into it and icing doesn't form. But this complex design, which came from Russian design, has been simplified into the next block, which you call C25 command block. It's yet another uh, beautiful design, but it looks more similar and elegant to manufacture. Similarly, you can see various similar items like the mixture ratio control valve uh, of various things, metering valves. Uh, uh, we have uh, isolation valves which are operated using pyro valves, where our metallic diaphragms are sheared using uh, explosives. We'll admit liquid only when it is need to be admitted to ensure hermetic sealing. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So, for a typical rocket engine uh, where cryogenic engine is involved, some 25 to 30 different control components are to be designed and manufactured, and each of them will go through its own development cycle, failures, requalifications, and flight assemblies and testing over a period of time. So, the challenge is in designing precision metallic material. Com they are all moving systems with sealing. O-rings, gaps, control, magnet, magnets, electromagnets, and things like that. And the precision and quality, for example, the contamination control becomes so critical. Uh, and this is the challenge in building these complex systems for supporting the engine to start and operate safely in flight. And probably, you know, the last mission of GSLV had a failure. And the failure was primarily due to one of the such valves. It has to seat and come and seat and leak tight in flight, and but that valve happened to be in the hydrogen circuit. And during launch, hydrogen was lost through the seal. And in over a period of uh, the lower stage burning, the pressure in the tank dropped to a level that the engines, uh, the pumps cavitated. Hence, the engine cannot start. So very simple a failure in one of the component can lead to the rocket failure. So this is a very critical domain. It's not the engine alone. It is the rest of the smaller elements of the stage that make everything safe. But the, for all of them, we go through the cryocompatible material selection, the complex thermostructural analysis when the flow of the liquids and fluids happen through this, how the dimension changes, and uh, what are the uh, contamination-related issues that can come up, including lubrication of moving parts in, in internally, and the impact of electrical systems on the cryogenic components, heating on account of the coils and magnets which are part of some of these devices, etc. So all these are to be very detailed, we analyze a safe command control component. So some of the challenges in cryogenic propulsion are well known, uh, well known so I am not going to dwell on it them. Uh, and uh, all of you who are experts in this domain must be fully aware of some of these complex problems, which are so I will skip it for somebody else to speak about. And equally important are the analytical capability that we need to develop for cryogenic systems, which includes cycle analysis, uh, rotor dynamic analysis, softwares for fluid, flu, fluid flow, thermal analysis, combustion instability, which I uh, did not discuss, the CFD flow field analysis with the chambers and flow paths, the liquid movement inside the tank, which I described in the uh, earlier time, as well as stratification analysis and how the filling has to be done in the tank, as well as expulsion has to be done. 
engine modeling so that it can fit into the overall software of the simulating rocket part and also its control during flight. So all of this requires large amount of software development to support the cryogenic engine and stage development. Insulation is another domain where a lot of work is done by our chemical team to develop a low, co low mass, low cost insulation, which is something phenomenally working. In the next rocket, we are making yet another drastic improvement in terms of its quality through appropriate uh, new chemical that are coming to the uh, insulation domain. Of course, I will all invite you people to come to IPRC Mahendragiri someday to look at the facilities that they have built for the cryogenics with the support of the Indian industry and also the industries across the world. They have contributed to building uh, facilities for liquid gaseous handling, liquids handling in large quantities and also it's servicing to meet the engine test requirements, uh, including the ground-based testing facilities as well as the vacuum test facilities. Also, the hydrogen production facility that is already existing both at uh, Mahindragiri as well as at uh, Andhra Sugars for supplying the liquid hydrogen for the entire launch vehicle program. Now, coming to the C25 stage of GSLV Mark III, this has been uh, one area which I had opportunity to associate with the team for development. And my role was as a structural engineer, I contributed for this engine, not as a propulsion engineer. So I can talk much about the structural design of a rocket engine itself, which is a very complex problem that we understood. For example, I'll tell you one, the moment simply you fill the liquid in the engine, the engine deflects by 0.3 degree. So this is a very new, new understanding that the thermal distortions within the engine can cause mechanical distortion in the engine. And this, if you don't control it, then the entire thrust control of the alignment of the whole rocket will go. So we need to engineer structural systems to get the dynamic characteristics, the thermal, thermostructural characteristics, etc. This is something which I could co contribute to our team at LPSC did. And it also has a beautiful engineering design where unlike the single shaft design of the CUS engine that we use in Russian engine, Russian derived CUS engine, here we use two separate turbo pumps one for liquid oxygen, one for liquid hydrogen driven in two separate shafts and, uh, and a gas generator which drives the, these turbo pumps. A thrust chamber which is uh, having a copper stainless steel layered structure with uh, bracing which in between and also it doesn't have a uh, uh, control system as we use in uh, like uh, AVR is not there in C25 and uh, <coughs> similar type of control components mostly used in this C25 engine. And we've gone through hundreds of such tests. And uh, number of tests that are required to qualify each of them, what is indicated there are simply typical. And one beauty of the development of C25 is that we never faced any major anomaly during its development. That uh, Dr. Narayan is always very proud when he speaks about it. Unlike the engines developed across the world where the first test normally end up in an explosion, and this uh, we never saw any any major explosion for this engine development testing. It, uh, though there were some hiccups here and there, there were no major failures that we encountered throughout the development phase of these hundreds of tests that we did. And what I am showing here is the first of the tests which uh, I also got involved, the very first test where the thrust chamber was mounted to the test facility in a horizontal manner and we were admitting hydrogen and oxygen at high pressures. Here turbo pumps were not used. Liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen were pumped at the out delivery conditions of the turbo pumps and fed directly into the chamber to have the first of ignitions of the very first firing of this engine. And this one of the beautiful moments in our development history that we saw the flame of this coming out through this engine. Later, we could perfect it into a full-fledged engine. And it went into the testing in the hat facility uh, and the engine went through all the qualification programs which I will not elaborate today. And finally, the C25 stage came out and we had the first successful launch of the very first maiden flight of this engine and stage on 5th June 2017. And we are now ready with the fourth stage going for launch on GSLA Mark III's M2 mission which will launch a private 36 satellites for one web and take this opportunity to give all your blessings to that engine so that it perform again this time as well successfully. Now, we are looking at how this stage can be further improved and this is something that we want to work on. One is that if this engine is not only going to perform putting a satellite up there, we are also using this stage to do a lot of maneuvers in space and do satellite separation under complex uh, demand of satellite customers. 
and also we need to improve the performance of the stage over a period of time. This, is, this has been our history, that we launched the first time, not that efficient system, but over a period of time we do incremental improvements in the engineering, the stage design, the performance, etc., so that our payload capability and flexibility grows. So this is one step towards this developing a C32 stage with a higher thrust C25, possibly it can have a re-ignition capability. A rocket which having re-ignition capability can produce higher payloads. How it, how it comes when you shut off and restart, your payload improves. But then we did a total re-engineering of the stage to bring out, bring down the mass and bring down simplicity in the architecture, quick to assemble and prepare a stage. You know, building a cryogenic stage requires six months of work, starting from the positioning of the tanks to even to connect the plumbings, weld it, leak check it, NDT it, insulate it, instrument it, and bring it out as a stage. It takes long time of work. So we looked at how we can reduce this time, how to re-engineer it using the available knowledge, and that we could do at least, I, I am I'm sure the assembly team today it will do this six months of work in few one or two months of work. And we will be able to launch it maybe in one year from now if uh, the LPSC team quickly work out all the activities. They are building the hardware and tanks for this uh, in the coming days. And with this, the GSLE Mar 3 payload capability will be at least enhanced by 450 kilograms. We are also looking at how the semi cryogenic engine can be integrated into GSLE Mar 3 in the coming days. I told you already the stage is engine, first part of the engine called the, the, uh, the combustion part or the turbine outlet part or the gas generator combustion part is getting ready, which will be tested soon. And this is the tur turbo pump of this semi cryogenic engine, uh, which has a power output of approximately 30 megawatt, I think, if I, eh? 36 megawatt. So this is a power in this engine, and uh, it's operated very high pressures. And uh, uh, we are, our fingers are crossed when we, when you admit the liquid and fluid into this, though there are sufficient number of tests done in the pump level with the both water and liquids. But when you actually admit uh, liquids into this for its first firing uh, time, it, it requires some great uh, expectation to go with a lot of blessings as well. Now, once this engine is ready, which is a 200-ton engine, we hope that core stage of our GSLE Mar 3 can be replaced by a stage like this. This project of building a semi cryogenic stage is already on, and most of the systems, what you see in the picture, are already realized, except, except the engine. And uh, with this induction, we hope that the performance of the GSLE Mar 3 can be improved and also bring in more greener technologies for in rocket engines than the hypergolic propulsion which we are currently using. <laughs> and this is the improvement that we look at when we replace the cryogenic upper stage by uh, the operated cryogenic engine and the semi-cryogenic replaces the uh, storable hypergolic engine. We will have a 5 ton to GTO capability in our newer rocket and all the work for it is currently going on. But in the cryogenic technology, it's not only the engines that we have a lot of other activities and expertise in terms of the facilities that are required. Of course, there will be a lot of talk, including the vacuum chambers that we operate at various facilities, including our satellite, satellite centers, payload development center at Mahamadabad. They build this and you operate it for all the payload system testing. They also develop the passive radiant coolers for infrared detectors of satellites, which are currently, which started long time back. And, and even now it is being used for all our geostationary based earth observation satellite where they work, look at earth uh, for imaging. Also the pumping system, that cryogenic pumping system that we use it for our vacuum testing, especially the electric propulsion thrusters, where right now we have a 3.5 meter diameter vacuum chamber for testing our thrusters and currently they are in installing a six meter diameter vacuum facility for testing our high thrust uh, electric propulsion thrusters in the future. And also the Stirling cycle coolers for our observation, Earth observation satellite where the detectors are to be cooled uh, for use, using Stirling coolers. This is also being developed by our satellite center. Now let me conclude my talk with a, some glimpse of our latest of the programs where possibly you may be interested, though it may not be immediately connected with the cryogenics. And it also connects with our propulsion developments. One of them is the autonomous scramjet testing where we are testing the scramjet engine in a, in a flight which will take it you to almost a steady flight of almost 200 seconds plus using kerosene and liquid oxygen 
uh, at atmospheric air as the as the fuel so here the yesterday there was an important test uh, at uh, mahindragiri testing the tied up you know igniters using that test facility and i understand the flow flow test was very successful and with that confidence that we will be going for further testing of this engine for uh, for testing it to send it to an altitude like uh, almost uh, 100 kilometers and then bring it down and get a hypersonic condition like a mac 5 plus then admit this uh, kerosene into it and then have sustained combustion in the scramjet ramjet mode so this is very complex system where we have developments in terms of the fluid handling high temperature materials like the uh, ceramic metal ceramic materials and also complex aerodynamic problem handling how uh, the supersonic itself can compress the air and then admit into a compression chamber and produce sustained thrust over a period of time so this is a very challenging work we are currently trying to do another important work we are trying to do is to develop throttleable engines for future reusability so we are trying to look at how our one of the rocket we have developed recently to use it as a landing demonstration test for future use of uh, vertical landing technology and this is not the one which will actually fly for future but this is only a technology demonstrator to demonstrate the algorithms as well as throttling concept in the future see all of you know that the propulsion technology is now slowly moving away from lox kerosene concept to more of methane engines primarily driven by the idea that methane is the fuel of the future because you know methane can be synthesized in space using carbon dioxide and water using uh, certain reactions and this synthesis of methane enables use of methane and oxygen as a fuel for the future and it also good for the engines you methane because you know the problem associated with kerosene are of uh, are not much prevalent when you use methane so the world over methane based engines are being developed and being inducted and isro also uh, the methane development has already been initiated and probably this will be talked much detail by dr narayanan and another important area is the hybrid propulsion that we are working on uh, we were looking at how to use uh, htpb the our our uh, strong uh, solid propellant as a fuel and then use liquid oxygen as a Uh, as a oxidizer and this design we we could complete and successfully conduct its uh, strategy test also and this will slowly feed into a future throttleable uh, hybrid rocket in the future and we are planning to launch this using a sounding rocket as a test bed in the future and also we are developing more greener propellants for satellites especially in the hydrogen peroxide based propulsion and the, here again there are different streams being worked out hydrogen peroxide with kerosene and also by uh, the uh, uh, as a decomposition reaction itself producing thrust for more greener propulsion system wherever human beings are involved such as gaganyan even adn based propulsion development has been going on for some time but it has not matured to a level to produce in large quantity even now another area is electric propulsion where we have already launched one of our uh, electric propulsion satellites but in the future we are planning to launch a high thrust electric propulsion system in one of our satellites currently the work on development of this is going on basic primarily based on xenon gas and also using a stationary plasma thrusters of uh, 300 mN thrust capability and also to have multiple thrusters for steering those satellites from uh, low earth orbit to or geo uh, synchronous orbit uh, to geo stationary orbit movement so this currently is going on possibly by next year we should be able to have a launch of this thrusters in one of our isro satellite of course i will skip this part basically i already mentioned about the work done on the our new generation launch vehicle its variants this is currently on drawing board and we are also looking at how future satellites of various uh, advanced technologies can be developed including all electric propulsion satellites and high uh, ma high massive buses which will do for communication domain specifically software driven satellites etc gaganyan is another important domain uh, where we are working so much uh, especially to send uh, indians to space and uh, also bring them back safely so this will be actually using the gsli mar 3 rocket and we are trying to complete most of the developments in the coming next year where test flights will take place unmanned mission also will take place and we will be targeting the ultimate human space flight by 2024 and we are also looking at how human space program can further extend in the coming years 
So here the proposal for extending the human presence in space using Indian habitats or also to go propose uh, missions to interplanetary, possibly robotic missions, etc. in the beginning for exploration, also mining of space assets, etc. from other planets must be thought about. These are not announced plans, but these are the work that we currently do on paper. So taking us to continue the Gaganyan activity in the future. So we have created a long roadmap where the development of satellites, launch vehicles, propulsion technologies fit into the overall framework of what we want to achieve in the coming days. And the, high, the, the important theme is to have higher payload capability for us, reusability of rockets, more greener propulsion in rocket engines, and more industrially friendly production capability for rockets and corresponding systems for our future programs. And we, we, we think that if you do all of this, the scale of operation of our space ecosystem will grow substantially from the current 13,500 crore budget to almost 50,000 crore economy in space sector, where the regular production of the rockets, et cetera, will move to the industry, and ISRO will be concentrating on fewer, newer technologies and exploratory missions and higher levels of R&D in the future. So with this, let me conclude my talk. Uh, I believe that my talk would have given a certain glimpse of what we do in ISRO and not into greater detail. Uh, and uh, this is not the time to go into the detail. I believe that, of course, there are detailed talking and subjects. My role here was more of an inspirational person to understand that the role of cryogenic technology in space program is very, very important. And we are also looking at people with greater expertise in various domains because cryogenic technology is one specific domain. It has so many domains. We have people who work in non-metallic materials in cryogenics. We have people who work in metallurgical domain and understanding the cryogenics. We have people who have so much a concentration on heat transfer problems related to uh, cryogenic fluids in uh, space. We also have people who work on the entire cryogenic engine as well. So we, we, are, look, we are an assemblage of people who have an end-to-end -end understanding of cryogenic technology within ISRO. Of course, with the support of the academia and industries, we are able to build certain systems in ISRO and make it to a perfection. So let me take this opportunity to thank all of those contributors to our program. As I mentioned here, it's not the result of some of the people in ISRO, but it's the result of the entire community of cryogenic scientists available in this country and industries available in this country. Thank you so much. All the very best to the conference. <laughs> Any questions if you have? If uh, Chair are allow. <laughs> well, they are allowed just one or two because we are running kind of uh, feeling a little time pressure. So. Yes. Thank you very much for the fantastic talk and uh, could get a glimpse of the entire cryogenic community and non-cryogenic community also. My question is, uh, I've attended this in-space program that happened in Ahmedabad, and Dr. Pawan Koenka and yourself are the in charge. Do you see the role, a bigger role coming for the startups in the space domain when the entire space, let's say, in India is covered by government as such? So do you think that the startups really have some stakes in the space domain? Yeah, the answer is yes. Answer is a big yes, because startups uh, have. If they remain a startup, it, it will not be good. They have to graduate to a uh, industry delivery level. I believe that they have two, three important roles to play. One, the most important thing is that they can innovate and find out methods and applications which are hitherto not done. From that point of view, we should encourage startup. And I have seen some examples are. The first time additive manufactured liquid engines were manufactured by a startup, not by ISRO, for example. Why ISRO couldn't do it so far? I will ask this question to our own team. It was done by a startup, and it is successfully done, and they have tested it. There, the first time use of a remote sensing data for banking agriculture loan was done by a startup, not by ISRO. So it all indicates that if you encourage startup, they can bring out solutions to real problems Sometimes, surprisingly, more innovative solutions can come out in startups. This, I believe, it is possible. And this is why today, Prime Minister is uh, maybe tomorrow, I think, today or tomorrow, he may be announcing 75 challenges for space startups to take up and then get funded from uh, a separate pool of fund. And these problems are already going to be announced. So 
we know that there is lot of talent outside to come out with innovative ideas. This is the first part. Second is, there is a business opportunity in space, which is still not explored fully. Uh, the part is more into the downstream of the activities of space sector, not building rockets and satellites alone, but making use of the satellites and space-based systems to produce tangible outcome in, in terms of the business. For example, remote sensing data, communication segment, navic and timing services to do certain amount of business. So here again, I have seen a lot of ideas come from startup companies who are able to monetize already existing data to generate revenue out of it. So that's again, it gives more jobs. It also creates more, more demand for more satellites to be put. For example, one company called SatSure in Bangalore were able to do a lot of banking services using remote sensing data. After reaching a certain level, now they think that they have to build satellites of themselves because they are not getting data for themselves. And they are building two satellites in Bangalore by a private company. And they, sometimes we will launch it for them. So if you do downstream work, it actually increases upstream work, like building satellites, building new launch vehicles. Of course, there are startups building rockets in India, but they are building smaller rockets. But if you are to become commercially viable, they will have to graduate to a higher level. So I will wait for their success to happen. I think it is possible and startup have a great future in India. I am, I am very sure about it. Thank you, Somnathji, for answering the question from our president. And uh, that uh, ends our program for today. I mean, this particular session. Now I request my colleague, Dr. T.S. Datta, to kindly present a small memento to our speaker on behalf of the conference organizers. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Now our next uh, speaker is another luminary from the Indian science scenario, Professor Sashank Chaturvedi, Director of Institute of Plasma Research, Gandhinagar, Gujarat. Dr. Sasang Chaturvedi got his B.Tech in Chemical Engineering from IIT Delhi, where he was awarded the Silver Medal for standing first in the department. He then got his Ph.D. in Chemical Engineering from Princeton University, USA. His Ph.D. work involved the computational study of a novel nuclear fusion reactor concept. He was awarded the Umibaba Science and Technology Award of the Department of Atomic Energy, India, in 2005. He is a fellow of the Indian National Academy of Engineering and a senior professor in the Humibaba National Institute, HBNI. He has earlier served as head computational analysis division in the Baba Atomic Research Center. Professor Chaturvedi is presently serving as a director from 2016 of the Institute of Plasma Research, Gandhinagar. His research interests include numerical modeling of pulsed power plasma systems, including high-speed impact, shock waves, pulsed electromagnetics, high-performance computing, theoretical and experimental determination of material properties like capacity, equation of state, under extreme conditions and automated processing of signals, voice, image, and video data. So, Professor Chaturvedi. Again, we have nominally 40 minutes, uh, but we will not stop. I, I normally go fast. Yeah, so, I took only one minute in my <laughs> we'll not opening. Stop. We want to benefit <laughs> from your knowledge Thank and uh, just you have to be nice. Okay, I'll uh, be cover discussing cryogenics and superconductivity and the applications for fusion and plasma research in India. Something about the current status and something about what we require. Now just a quick introduction to plasmas because it may not be something familiar to everyone. Now we are used to the three states of matter, ice, solid, liquid and vapor, gases. And you know you keep adding heat so it gets anything would get transformed from solid to liquid to vapor. If you keep heating it further, if it reach temperatures of five or 10,000 degrees or more, it becomes a plasma. And the basic difference between plasmas and the other states of matter are, the other states are made of electrically neutral particles. They, are, they can be atoms or molecules. But in a plasma, there's sufficient energy in the particles so that the electrons, the bound electrons get stripped. So you end up with a mixture of free electrons and ions, and of course also of the normal atoms and molecules. 
this mixture is a is called a plasma and it behaves very differently from say a gas the reason being the charged particles interact through the coulomb force so you have long range forces existing there so plasma is respond to application of electric or magnetic fields that's the thing to remember okay now another thing that sets plasmas apart from the other states is the enormous range of parameters over which plasmas exist in fact most of the matter in the universe is plasma starting with the aurora the no northern lights now this is a scale with the temperatures and log scale of a million of degrees this is the number density of charged particles per meter cube aurora is out here a few thousand degrees in temperature number density is very low even a flame has a certain amount of plasma you have a certain degree of ionization there you come up to neon lights fluorescent tubes they have plasmas the temperature gets up to about 10000 kelvin or so and the density is still about 1 billion times less than that of air the solar corona is out here about a million degrees again the density is pretty low when you come to lightning because that happens in the atmosphere so the density is close to that of the atmosphere but the temperature is again tens of thousands of degrees then you come to magnetic fusion magnetic confinement fusion which is which be the bulk of my talk which is the uh, main approach to fusion today nuclear fusion the temperature gets up to about, needs to get up to about 100 million degrees the densities in magnetic fusion machines are about uh, about million times or 1 lakh times lower than that of air then you have thermonuclear weapons around the same range and another approach to fusion called inertial confinement fusion or laser driven fusion where the density is very high it's higher than that of a solid but the temperatures are still hundreds of millions of degrees so it's the enormous range of densities and temperatures which is why plasmas can be used to do a lot of things depending on which material you make the plasma out of which density and which temperature so let's see how do you create a plasma just some videos you can uh, let me see if i can play these videos yeah you can have a bunsen burner a flame that has some plasma so you've given thermal energy you get a plasma you can give electrical energy to something you have a spark just a normal electrical spark that's a plasma you can use a laser or any kind of optical energy you shine a laser on a solid it blows off you get a plasma for a short time or you could use radio frequency waves microwaves for example so you can have a microwave produce plasma so all different ways of producing plasma it's just a way of producing pumping energy into some solid or liquid or gas now because of this huge range of temperatures which can range over uh, you know several several orders of magnitude density ranges which can ra cover several orders of magnitude and material you can take anything and turn it into a plasma plasmas provide give you a lot of options for doing useful things with them so you can have cold or warm plasmas for societal and industrial applications which are everyday things that you see uh, dr somna just talked about plasma thrusters so in space flight propulsion systems you can have plasmas <coughs> you have plasma discharge tubes neon lamps your plasmas for what is called plasma nitriding which is used to increase the life of industrial tools you can have neon lamp displays there are things called dusty plasmas which turn out to be important in astrophysics you have plasma torches which you see in everyday life around you you see welding and so on you can have sparks you have circuit breakers used in industry so there is huge range now these are all low temperature relatively what we call low temperature plasmas the temperature is still thousands of degrees but it's low at the other extreme are the nuclear fusion relevant plasmas they are called hot plasmas what do you what do you want to do now the way the sun produces energy is you know it has hydrogen atoms four hydrogen nuclei come together they give you helium and in the process you get some energy now unfortunately the rate of reaction in these hydrogen plasmas is very very low so that means if i give you a certain bunch say, let's say a room full of hydrogen plasma and ask it to react under the conditions of that at the center of the sun the rate of reaction would be very very low we can't afford that on earth we have need to have a machine a machine costs money so we need, we used two isotopes of hydrogen which are called deuterium and tritium now that's what's shown in this video i think it'll cycle back so two isotopes deuterium and tritium which we try to fuse they produce helium and a neutron but to produce this reaction basically what you're doing is to use light elements to fuse and form heavy elements for this reaction you need temperature of about 100 million degrees or higher what's the advantage why are we trying for it there's no carbon emission or low carbon emission the abundant fuel hydrogen and lithium there's no long lived radioactive waste unlike normal uh, nuclear nuclear power and they are inherently safe now stars are natural fusion reactors but they operate in the vacuum of space they have that big advantage and the gravity holds the plasma together on earth if you try to do the same thing it needs a whole range of technologies and i'll explain why 
what we do is because the plasma is very hot you have to keep it away, away from the surroundings so you can put it inside some vessel made of say stainless steel but the stainless steel vessel will get damaged because the plasma hot particles keep hitting the surface so you have to somehow insulate the thing you don't have to stop the plasma particles going towards the wall how do you do that you create what is called a magnetic cage so that prevents heat and uh, heat and particles from escaping to the adjacent walls we use a shape called a bicycle like a bicycle tube that's called a torus so you can see this yellow thing here near which is the plasma and all the red colored things are the electromagnets which produce the magnetic cage so what that happens is this is the kind of machine you get we have a magnetic cage which encloses the plasma which sort of threads the gap inside the magnet okay and this uh, animation shows how the plasma moves the plasma is contained those are those green and red particles that you see inside the inside the cage now the plasma this plasmas have to be kept at very low density the density has to be about a 1 lakh times lower than that of the atmosphere so you need ultra high vacuum systems and these are very large systems they are cubic meters tens of cubic meters very and very ultra high vacuum which have you have to go down to 10 to the minus 8 millibar so <coughs> for that you need high performance vacuum pumps and you need special materials the plasma has to be heated up to these temperatures how do you do that you have to continuously heat up heat it using either rf microwaves different kinds of electromagnetic waves or you can do it using high energy particle beams there are two methods so that leads you to whole class of a requirement for megawatt class microwave sources and particle beams that's a whole range of technologies a class of technologies in itself okay now you pump all the put it, all this energy into the plasma but the plasma is continuously losing energy you know you got a hot material it will lose energy by conduction convection and radiation where does the heat go so i have to receive the heat i can't allow the heat to go to the stainless steel wall the wall will get damaged so we uh, create a the magnetic cage is shaped in such a way that all the heat lands up on a small surface which is called a diverter plate the diverter plate then has to take heat loads which are in the range of 10 to 20 megawatts per meter square that's the kind of load that you have when a missile reenters the atmosphere or when a space shuttle reenters the atmosphere the difference is a missile e is exposed to the he heat loads for about 3 minutes or 4 minutes a fusion reactor must work continuously so i have to have a some uh, device some structure and materials which can take a load of 10 to 20 megawatts per meter square continuously and remember a plasma is not a very nice uh, thing which sits there it's very unstable the plasmas don't like to be uh, kept inside a cage so they keep trying to leak out so uh, occasionally the heat load rises to 100 megawatts per meter square and all my uh, structure for uh, removing the heat has to be designed for that so we need high heat loads handling uh, capacity then once the plasma starts working once you've got fusion conditions you have 14 mev neutrons coming out so the neutrons they activate things around them the radioactivity that you get is not long lived not like fission reactors but it is still there so no human being can actually approach a approach a fusion reactor when it's actually working another issue is the complexity of the geometry i showed you the shape that is like a torus like a bicycle tube how do you access anything inside the bicycle tube because things will keep getting damaged there'll be tiles in there there'll be uh, high heat flux components which get damaged so you have to keep removing them replacing bad parts defective parts and so on so you need remote handling and the remote handling that you have here is far more complex than you require in a normal nuclear environment because you have very you have ultra high vacuum you have the nuclear environment anyway and o o on top of that <coughs> the uh, other is a very high magnetic field this thing has to work inside very high magnetic fields so the remote handling systems we have are more complex than you have in space applications or underwater and of course come to the topic of this conference is cryogenics we use superconducting magnets because if we, if we use copper magnets they simply would consume too much power we could remove the power but then who would pay for the electricity you would end up dissipating more electric power than you would be getting out of the fusion machine so we need superconducting magnets and that's where the cryogenics comes in apart from this very quickly you have high speed data acquisition control a plasma is almost massless it moves on time scales of microseconds you have to have fast feedback control systems which work on millisecond time scales so this is another issue you need heavy engineering because the entire plasma system the magnets and everything has to be enclosed inside a cryostat it's a very high it's like a refrigerator a vacuum flask which is enormous so you need a strong support structure and a cryostat which must handle all the electromagnetic loads and the ultra high vacuum and of course the cryogenics we need sensors you can't stick anything inside the plasma to measure anything because it's too hot the heat fluxes would be too high so you need sensors ranging from radio waves all the way up to gamma rays everything in between and finally you have all those magnets and the power supplies uh, and the rf sources you need to drive them with very high rating power supplies 
In fact, much of the cost of a fusion reactor goes into the power supplies, high voltage, high current systems. Okay, let me just give some idea. Now coming to the topic of this conference progressively, what kind of magnets do we need? If you look at the magnets required by the ITER machine, the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor being built in France. <coughs> now the magnets, you know, are they, they are the, it is what shapes and confines the hot plasma. So ITER has a central solenoid which will be 13 meters high and weigh about 1,000 tons. The 18 toroidal field coils, see these yellow colored things, yellow brown colored things, each is 17 meters high, weighs 360 tons. The six polaroidal field coils, eight to 24 meters in diameter, 200 to 400 tons each. So everything in fusion is large. Now, uh, you know that India is one of the equal, the partners, one of the equal partners contributing to building the ITER project in France. So this has become a national effort, the Indian contribution. And there's been a major participation, effort and participation from DAE as well as from industry. It's a matter of pride for all of us that the Indian in-kind commitments have so far been completed to schedule. I'll just take one minute to show a video which will quickly summarize the kind of contributions we are making. This is a cutaway view of the ITER machine. There's a standard two meter human standing down there, just to give perspective. So uh, one thing we are making is the cryostat. We have made, it has been delivered to France. It's 3,800 tons of steel, 16,000 meter cube is the enclosed volume. So this was made in segments, small sectors, which were made in Alassane and Tubro in Hazira, uh, in Yasurat, sent by ship to France, where they've been put together again. Then we are providing involved shielding, which provides neutron shielding for the 14 MeV neutrons that come out. It stops the uh, the, those things coming out. We are providing some uh, part of the RF sources. This is in the range of uh, 40, 35 to 65 megahertz range, multi-megawatt uh, uh, RF sources. We have provided the, again, this has been done by LNT, providing the cooling water system, about a one gigawatt system out there. So th just some pictures of uh, the thing being made in LNT and Kaluaskar. So you see, it's been a very strong interaction between ITER India and Indian industry, every part of it. Then flyover lines, which have been made again in India, again, a lot of major contributions coming from INOX in Baroda, which did ma develop many of these technologies for the first time. It had never been done in India. And diagnostic neutral beams and so on. Okay. Let me come out here. Now let me come to the Indian program. This, this is what our, our contributions to the ITER project in France. In uh, IPR, we have two tokamaks, working tokamaks. One is the Aditya upgrade tokamak. Initially, we had the first Indian tokamak that was called Aditya. What we have now is the Aditya upgrade, which is a modified version of the same thing. But it was stripped down to the bottom and built up again. So these are the kinds of numbers. This, this is a mid-sized to uh, size tokamak with all copper coils. Gives you a bird, bird's eye view. It has experimental campaigns throughout the year. Typically around, when it's operating, it's around 15 discharges a day from Tuesday to Friday. We shut it down on Monday for cleaning and various other things. The steady state superconducting tokamak, SST1, the, which has a plasma minor radius of around 0.2 meters, a major radius of 1.1, again a hydrogen plasma. So far we've been operating with circular plasma, circular cross-section plasmas, although it's supposed to be going to an elongated plasma. The total extra heating that we're putting in from outside using RF is Using gyrotrons, we put we are put in about 0.5 megawatt. With low, uh, another thing which is in the few gigahertz range, using klystrons, it's a 0.5 megawatt. And now we are planning to put in ion cyclotron heating, which will be in the 25 to 45 megahertz range, about about one megawatt. This is still in the being coupled to the machine. The experimental campaigns here, because this is a superconducting tokamak, are just two to three per annum. It, and when it's operating, there's round the clock operation. There's a 25 ton cold mass. There's a cool down time of 14 days because you have to cool it down uh, slowly. Number one, it depends on the capacity of the cryo system. The second is not, uh, not to allow thermal stresses to build up. And the warm up time is about eight days. So e effectively we get an experiment window of operation each time for about nine to 10 days. So far we've been doing hydrogen circular plasma operation with the main magnetic field that's called the toroidal field of 1.5 Tesla. Although SST has been designed for three Tesla. We are planning shape plasma operation. I'll come to certain things that we've achieved, certain things which we've not been able to achieve and what we are doing to address that. Okay, but before I get into SST and these things, I'd like to point out a few other things that we are doing at IPR, which requires strong electromagnets. These are non-fusion applications. Now one is for the certain applications in Tokamax, you need to inject particles, solid particles or pellets at very high velocities. 
these can be powders also or they can be and these are non conducting materials jointly with blc vizag the baba atomic research center at vizag we have developed a coil gun an electromagnetic coil gun which is which can accelerate a a, a sabo and a metallic sabo which contains the powder that you actually want to inject so what happens is that this uh, using an electromagnetic uh, you see this is the process by which it happens you have a solenoids out here you pass a pulsed current in that the projectile sits inside that it's a cylindrical projectile so when this thing is when the current flows you get an induced current in the opposite direction inside the, the sabo the metallic shell the sabo gets thrown out because you know currents in opposite directions repel each other so it gets thrown out at velocities of a few hundred meters per second so this has been extensively developed at blc vizag and then we coupled it to our own tokamak so in fact it was done for the first time in the world we have actually injected done electromagnetic injection into a tokamak this is just showing you a bench uh, measurement we have particles being accelerated inside the gun and then we did a firing into into the aditya upgrade tokamak that was for the first time in the world this is a high speed video of the plasma right now you can't see much of the plasma except a small glow here because the hot plasma of the plasma is not visible it doesn't emit in the visible range what you're seeing here is where the plasma is touching the wall now at some point you'll see the particles coming into the plasma that's when it becomes luminous so these are lithium titanate particles injected now you can see these particles coming in the velocity is around 2 to 300 meters per second they come in they emit a flash of radiation the plasma cools down and it quenches it finishes off the plasma this is it turns out is something of great importance for the eater project for something called disruption mitigation okay now so for this one for this coil gun so far we are using copper coils but beyond a certain point we would like to, for certain other applications we would need like to go to superconducting coils so that is where so we need superconducting magnets these are very demanding things because the internal magnetic field can go up to tens of tesla and the uh, a, a major because it's a pulse thing second point is the db by dt the rate of change of magnetic field is very high so this would be very demanding in terms of the uh, superconducting technology uh, something that we started about 2 years back because we had a lot of experience with uh, developing plasma uh, uh, systems for different kinds of plasmas coupled heated with different kinds of mechanisms so we started developing what are called helicon plasma thrusters now the advantage of helicon thrusters is that they have a very high specific impulse dr somnath showed something about electric thrusters during his presentation this is one kind of electric thruster the reason we started with helicon was because at ipr we had a lot of experience investigating the physics of electromagnetic coupling to helicon plasma uh, to these things we are currently using an rf source of 13.56 megahertz at 5 kilowatts with a helicon antenna we made our own strain gauge sensors thrust sensors and so on an electromagnetic or electromagnetic copper magnets or permanent magnets of 1.5 kilogauss with argon gas remember all the experiments are being done with argon not with xenon so with this we went with at 5 kilowatts we achieved more than 90 millinewtons at 2 kilogauss now we are trying to increase the magnetic field and if we put in xenon the, the thrust will go up because xenon is a heavier gas we also already started development of a 10 kilowatt helicon source under in this thing let me just see if the video works so it just shows a video of the operation starting up the power of course it's a steady state thing you can keep running it continuously when you started up this is how the glow comes out from that and just a quick view let's see of the strain sensor the strain gauge based sensor for measuring the thrust this is like a pendulum which gets deflected it's like a strain gauge so by from the strain gauge measurement you can measure the thrust okay so again these things when we go to the longer term applications they cannot work with either permanent magnets or with uh, copper magnets they would require high, temp high temperature superconducting magnets i'll come to that in in a few minutes a third thing we are doing on a small scale this is because of some application not related to ipr it is some other agency that wants this that's to try and develop a small scale electromagnetic aircraft launch system it's called emails now uh, emails of course occur at all kinds of sizes the one we are targeting as a first step is to have an electromagnetic launch system for for uavs for launching small uavs the standard requirement is in a uav you would have a mass of around 100 kilos which means the entire mass of the that, that you have to accelerate is about 120 kilos and you would need a takeoff speed of around 40 meters per second so that would be good enough for launching these things and similar after beyond that of course you can go to elect, air, aircraft launch from aircraft carrier which is a much bigger system this is what we are targeting in our ongoing project we have made some preliminary uh, uh, systems in this direction this is what we made maybe this video will work this is just a lab setup right now for a small scale system yeah so it shows you the acceleration there 
So basically you do static tests where you can measure the thrust, then you do dynamic tests where you actually measure the actual movement and acceleration of this thing. Okay, so th this, and currently we are de developing the prototype for this one, that's eight kilonewtons, 100 kilogram system. That's under fabrication now. We're hoping in the next few months, we should have it there. We've already got a test facility done for doing the measurements, outdoor facility for this. Okay, again, emails will have to move to high temperature superconductors. They cannot go on with copper beyond a certain point. Okay. Now let me come to cryogenics for fusion systems at IPR because I started with fusion. In the mean, uh, along the way I deviated to non-fusion applications where we are interested and now I'm coming back to the fusion systems. Yeah. Okay, <coughs> the first one is of course the biggest application is in the SST1 cryo plant. Separately, there's a neutral beam injector which has its own cryo plant, a smaller one. We have some work on development of cryo pumps. Uh, then, of course, the ITER contributions related to cryogenics. Uh, we also have a program for developing an indigenous cryo plant. And separately, there are indigenous technology developments going on in current leads, HTS and uh, MGB2 based. Certain types of cryo components that we needed from time to time, cryo lines, electrical brakes, vacuum barrier. In fact, this became a critical activity for the SST1 because the imported uh, <coughs> lines <coughs> created some trouble, so we had to develop our own. And then we have some R&D on superconducting coils for producing higher magnetic fields. So I'll just go through these quickly. Uh, remember that cryogenics is not my own area, so I'm not really competent to answer technical questions in these, but I have my colleagues sitting here, and I think they will have papers in the course of this uh, workshop. So they'll be answer, able to answer questions in more detail. Okay. Coming to the SST1 helium cryogenic system, the total refrigeration power required is 650 watts at 4.5 Kelvin. Apart from that, we have a liquefaction requirement because we have current leads for feeding the uh, superconducting magnets. So we need something like 200 liters per hour because there are 20 numbers of helium co vapor cooled current leads. Each lead would need around 0.25 grams per second liquid helium. So with the safety margin, we require about seven grams per second. So therefore the total helium plant capacity is around 1350 watts at 4.5 Kelvin. This was installed and commissioned in 2003, 2004. Currently it's operating at those at the rated parameters. Uh, to support that there's a, a 10 to the five liters, one lakh liters liquid nitrogen storage and distribution system, an integrated flow distribution and control systems, and superconducting current feeder system. Okay, just some pictures of the cryogenic system. Again, I won't go into detail here. I'm sure there'll be other presentations on these topics. Okay. <coughs> Coming to the superconducting current feeder system for SST1. So it just shows you some pictures of this thing. The place where we started having trouble, which I'll get into slightly more detail. Uh, see, one are the toroidal field coils, which are switched on, uh, you energize them, they produce the main magnetic field. Once they are switched on, they stay switched on. They remain continuous for the duration of the, uh, of the campaign. But apart from them, there are other plasma coils, which are called poroidal field coils, which are only operated for shaping the plasma. Now these are the ones we've had tr uh, trouble with for multiple reasons. I won't go into the details of those things because that has been, we've got, gone into that in depth and we are trying to find solutions for that short term, medium term, long term. Uh, one particular problem that we had was in the current feed to these things. Now the current feed here, you see, these are the problems we face. These are magnets. So you're feeding a large current to them. You have to go up to currents of a few kilo amperes into that. So one is you're carrying a high current. Second is, uh, under certain conditions, when you're operating the tokamak, there can be very high voltages induced in these lines. So you have a high current and at the same time a high voltage, which can cause electrical breakdown problems in the current feeds. The third is of course, these are operating at high vacuum because the cryostat operates at 10 to the minus five millibar. So you have a high vacuum there. And of course, all this is under cryogenic conditions. So you have a mixture of cryo and vacuum and high currents, which is high magnetic fields and high voltages, which is why the problem becomes complex. And this is where we had to start developing our own uh, system. Probably there'll be a presentation on this as we go along. Okay. Coming to another program, this is on a cryosorption cryo pump. Now, this is something that's been developed at IPR. Basically, we started out developing this for Tokamax because that is our primary program. Because they have, <coughs> sorry, they, they have very high uh, pumping requirements. But along the way, we found that the, the requirement for which, the, the machine for which the requirement was there would have come later. So we decided to sort of uh, come out with spin-offs on that. Now, what we've done in this thing is, it's a customized design as per using needs. We can uh, change it. It's a 100% make in India product. 
including the cryo adhesive, the sorbents, the coating panels, and so on. And we have the entire facility for making this in one uh, under one roof in IPR. Also, have an in-house facility for characterization and pumping performance. If you use liquid nitrogen, which is what we've been using there, the pumped gases can be nitrogen, argon, water vapor, and hydrocarbons. So these are the applications that can be handled. If you start using liquid helium with a cryocooler or, or a cryocooler, you can pump helium, hydrogen, xenon, and other gases. So this just shows you the various stages through which this thing goes through. Uh, I'm happy to report that these are things that we developed. Uh, one of these pumps that we developed, we supplied some of these. We've supplied to SAC, which is part of uh, ISRO in Ahmedabad. They had a requirement for the cryovac chambers where satellites are tested. So this uh, turned out to provide the same performance as imported cryo pumps. Now we have patented this technology. Uh, it got a name, Agastya. It's Agastya series of this thing. Agastya 400. Now we've started developing higher capacity pumps in the same area. This technology has recently been transferred to two private uh, industries for production. Uh, in fact, this was part of an MOU that we have between IPR and SAC ISRO in 2017. So these have been delivered, accepted. So that part is over. Now in parallel, we started developing Agastya for other applications. Uh, one was we have a high heat flux test facility. You remember I mentioned that some plasma components receive very high heat loads, 10 or 20 megawatts per meter square. So we have something called a high heat flux test facility. We can subject components to that end of heat load. That itself requires pumping. That required a cryo pump. So we were able to develop and install a cryo pump, I guess, at 250 for that. On SST1 itself, we've uh, recently demonstrated the performance of, I guess, 500. We're developing a Xenon cryo pump under development for other applications. There's some, just some pictures of the IPR team that developed it and the ISRO team with the IPR team when we handed over to SAC. This is the roadmap, tentative roadmap that we have for developing cryo pumps for fusion reactor applications, of course, with spin offs along the way. So we have a plan going right up to 2028 and then 2040, the long term part, def developing different kinds of things. So this is the first stage. We have done cryo pumps for ISRO, SST1, high heat flux, and so on, installed on SST1, and done technology transfer. In the next stage, over the next two, three years, we'll be developing these for pumping high Z gases. And also we've started a small program and trying to develop cryo coolers on now. Because uh, <coughs> with the make in India thrust, it has also, be, you, as you must all have realized, it's become very difficult to import things. So we thought we might, might as well start developing these things in India and by collaborating with academia, with industry and so on. So we started some work in this area. And beyond this, we started some experiments for pumping speed and capacity for high Z cryo pumps the concept of a vault technology for cryo pumps for fusion machines. Also, once we put them into fusion reactors, there's a problem of neutron load. Neutrons will be causing damage. So the adhesive will have to be neutron resistant. So we started some initial work on this thing. And of course, the cryo cooler. And beyond this, it'll go on. When we start going to tritium handling, it will be a whole different class. So this is just to illustrate the kind of uh, <coughs> wide range of applications that you have for cryo technologies, cryo pumps alone just in the fusion community. And apart from that, of course, there's a huge thing. And this is one place, one of the places where we would require participation from the entire Indian community in cryogenics, because the expertise is all, all out here. Okay, coming to what we've contributed to ITER. Excuse me. Yeah. Now, <coughs> in the ITER cryogenic system, how much time do we have? Good, thank you. That'll be enough. Yeah. Okay. Now, in ITER, the, there are different modes of operation. So the cryogenic system has to handle all the modes of operation. It's been designed for that. So, <coughs> for example, you can have 400 second plasma pulses with a fusion power of 500 megawatts, longer pulses with a slightly lower fusion load, then short pulses with a higher fusion power. Each of them will require different kinds of magnetic fields, different operating durations, and so on. So, <coughs> what the cryo system for example, cool down of cryo pumps would be required in order to pump the cryostat and the torus. And you would also require gradual cool down and filling of the magnetic system and, and thermal shields. Once you reach nominal operating conditions in the uh, um, magnet system, the cryogenic system must maintain these operating conditions over a wide range of operating modes, these ones. It also has to accommodate resistive transitions. Once in a while you might have a failure, you might have a transi sudden transition from superconducting to resistive, it must handle that. So there would be fast discharges of magnets, so the, uh, what we have been co covering is not the cryo plant uh, from India. We are covering the cryo distribution and the cryo line part of the system. 
that itself is huge because the cryo plant is located at quite a long distance from the eater, the magnets themselves.